Hello, this is Gordon Guyatt from McMaster University. Uh, this is a brief introduction to GRADE. It is uh, intended specifically for new members join, joining a World Health Organization guideline development group, but it could be used as an introduction for any panelists at any guideline who want a brief introduction to GRADE. What I'm going to do is talk about why we use GRADE and move on to GRADE basics, including rating the quality or certainty or confidence. These are synonyms of the evidence um, and moving on to the strength of recommendations. This is a uh, notation of the fact that there are more than a hundred organizations who have adopted GRADE. World Health Organization is just one. And what we would like to believe is that the wide uptake of GRADE reflects how clearly and carefully it has been developed and how useful it is in rating the quality of evidence and in moving from evidence to recommendations. So when you apply GRADE, what are we grading? There are two components. One is the quality, certainty, confidence in the evidence, which can be rated as high, moderate, low, or very low, four categories. Randomized trials start as high quality evidence, but as you will see, there are many reasons for rating down quality from randomized trials. Observational st studies start as low quality evidence, but on occasion, not very often, but on occasion, we can rate up the quality of evidence from observational studies to moderate or high. The strength of the recommendations, some organizations call them strong and weak. Others, like the World Health Organization, call them strong and conditional. But just as quality, confidence, and certainty are synonyms for the trustworthiness of the evidence, Conditional and weak are uh, synonyms for recommendations that are not strong. And the implications of that will become evident. So here is a slide that summarizes Grade's approach to rating the quality or certainty of the evidence. As you can see in the second column, the evidence can be rated as high, moderate, low, or very low. Randomized trials start as high quality or certainty evidence, excuse me, but there are a number of reasons why it might be rated down. One is risk of bias. You may have a number of randomized trials, but they may be unconcealed, unblinded, and lose large numbers of patients to follow up, in which case they will no longer provide high quality or certainty of evidence. The results may be inconsistent from study to study. Some studies may show large effects, others no effect at all, or even on the harm side. And we may be unable to explain the inconsistency. If that is the case, it will move down from high to moderate or moderate to low or low to very low, certainty or quality of evidence. Indirectness can be a problem. Uh, I'll use an example from my own clinical practice. I practice Excuse me. I practice as a hospital-based internal medicine specialist. Many of my patients nowadays, or quite a few anyway, are over 90. Um, I try to base my practice on randomized trials, but I am aware that very few people over 90 participated in the randomized trials that provide the source of evidence for my practice. As a result, the trial information from younger patients provides only indirect evidence for older patients. And indirectness is something that we have to consider uh, in World Health Organization and other guidelines. Imprecision, we may have a number of randomized trials, but the sample sizes may be small in all of them. Few events, wide confidence intervals, and that can lower our certainty. And finally, publication bias. Everything else can look okay, but if for some reason, particularly the negative trials have been withheld and are not available, then we can get biased estimates of effect. Okay, that's randomized trials. Over to observational studies. 
Observational studies start as low quality or certainty of evidence. And if they have any of the five problems that we've just been through, they can go to very low. But on occasion, they can go up to moderate or even high. So if you think of in interventions like having a hip replacement or uh, having a cardiac arrest and being resuscitated or having terminal renal failure and receiving dialysis or having anaphylactic shock and leaving, receiving epinephrine. These are all interventions that we are very confident are benefit and some, in some cases substantial benefit despite no randomized trials. Why? Because the effects are very large and uh, typically happen over a quite short period of time. So on rare occasions with very large effects, uh, observational studies can yield high quality or high certainty of evidence. So that's Grade's approach to rating the certainty or quality of evidence. Um, the recommendations that come from reviewing that evidence can either be strong or conditional. Strong recommendations occur when the benefits clearly outweigh the downsides or the downsides clearly outweigh the benefits. We can move from strong to conditional recommendations when we have low quality evidence. If the evidence is only low quality, it means we are unsure of the benefits and the downsides. And if we're unsure of the benefits and downsides, it's pretty difficult to say that one clearly outweighs the other. Excuse me. The other circumstance in which we might rate down the evidence, the, sorry, the recommendations from strong to conditional is when there's a close balance between the desirable and undesirable consequences of the intervention uh, and that close balance would prevent us from making a strong recommendation. And that is because people with different values and preferences when the balance is close are liable to make different choices. And value and preferences we think are crucial. Here are value and preferences that we invoked with a uh, some years ago with a World Health Organization recommendation about how to manage Ebola in uh, low income settings. And it had to do with uh, the recommended protection for the health workers. And if you were very protective, it would be, it really impaired potentially the care that was given to the patients. Uh, if not protected enough, there, the transmission risk would be greater. And so in deciding on the right strategy, the guideline panel considered the following values and preferences. They put a very high value on the possible but uncertain substantial mortality reduction versus a, with respect to care of the patient, versus a lower value to the very uncertain increase in transmission to the healthcare provider uh, by uh, less stringent protection. They put a high value on the uncertain improvement in the psychological well-being of patients who have more uh, access to the caregivers. Lower value and the very low but uncertain risk of transmission to the family. And a high value on pain reduction and lower value on the sensitivities of patient and family uh, when, for instance, giving narcotics to the, uh, uh, to the patient suffering from Ebola. So I think you can see that that's one set of values and preferences. You could have different ones and they would lead to different recommendations. So it's very important, and the WHO recognizes this, to be explicit about the values and preferences underlying the recommendations. We like this binary uh, uh, approach to strength of recommendations, strong and conditional. Why do we like it? One is we can be very specific about what it means. A strong recommendation means all or almost all fully, uh, fully informed patients would make the same choice. A conditional would mean that fully informed patients because of different values and preferences 
would make different choices. And that has implications for the healthcare provider's interaction with the patient. A strong recommendation if the panel is right, everybody or almost everybody would make the same choice. An extensive uh, value and preference uh, discussion is unnecessary. A conditional recommendation, if you want to get it right for the individual patient, you need to make sure that that patient's values and preferences are represented, and that means shared decision-making. WHO recommendations are oriented in two ways. One is for the interaction between the clinician and the patient, and the second at a health system level. Strong recommendation at a health system level would mean that all systems should adopt this as policy. A conditional recommendation means it may be right for some, but not others, or right to a varying degree under particular conditions. So that is the uh, pocket summary of the great approach that we apply in WHO and many, many other guidelines. Um, for the folks on the are joining the uh, WHO guideline development group uh, for which this talk was specifically prepared, although I'm hoping it might have other use for other folks. But for these people, I will be available after you review this to answer questions uh, prior to the first meeting if that is desirable. Thanks very much.